namely that games are generic and that the experiences of games are much more often than not generic experiences. I also want to add that for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be saying generic, but what I really mean is that game experiences are potentially generic. The games are generic, and the experiences thereof are potentially generic, since this depends upon the player's biography and previous experiences. So how are games generic? Well, my starting point will be genre theory or genre theories. So I know genre or genre, as we say in Denmark, which is going to be a problem for some of you, but I'm going to be proceeding with that. But before we get there, um, I'm going to take a detour since genre is just another word for category and categorization as an activity. So we're going to deal with the general problem of categories and categorization. Of course, I'm going to deal with it in a fairly fast and loose way. But since genre theory really is a theory of categorization, I'm going to go there first. And here are some of the approaches to that problem of categories. Well, first of all, there's the intuitively meaningful idea that category members are simply things that are similar to each other. Green things over here. The more fir formal version of that is to base category membership on necessary and sufficient traits or properties. So all the things that are green and round go over here, but the green and square ones go over here, and only those in those two boxes. There's also the idea that categories can be constructed around prototypes. Uh, this comes in two different flavors, an empirical version, where things exhibit prototype effects, and a kind of deductive uh, category by mandate version where you say that this is a prototype. Uh, usually these are based on similarities as well, only very fuzzily so, and it's kind of a cop-out to say that this is a prototype category because it doesn't really say how to sort of construct the membership around it. And then there's, of course, Wittgenstein's famous notion of family resemblance, uh, which also seems to be in many ways based on similarity, but with an emphatic rejection of the necessary and sufficient line in the sense that the category members don't share all of the traits. They're just similar to each other. And, well, there's probably no getting away from Wittgenstein in this language game, and I think theories of necessary and sufficient properties have very few subscribers these days. But a little example inspired by Danish linguist Louis Jelmslev may illustrate why family resemblances has its own problems, or have its own problems. Um, all of these things could be said to be related to each other in one or more ways. I find this somewhat problematic for a theory of um, game experiences, because there's no end to the stuff that might qualify for membership in this family resemblance. So one could say that categorization becomes a never-ending story when you do family resemblances. And I think Wittgenstein saw this as inevitable and deal with it, but, well, he's not here to foot the bill, so to speak. So, uh, a helpful position, I think, can be found in George Lakoff's work, which, uh, well, synthesizes uh, many of the previous approaches, actually, so he's taking more or less all of it on board, uh, but his proposal is based in cognitivism. Um, but I still think it's obviously indebted to Wittgenstein in that it emphasizes everyday activities and experience as a basis for categories this experiential and pragmatic dimension. And I want to focus on the kind of category here that Lake have defined, which is a category that things to take on a skiing trip, or the category of things to take to a philosophy of computer games conference. Because that's really what that contribution, I think, is that the structure of human activities and experience determine what goes in the bag, and that's not even family resemblances. They don't have to share anything other than they're very good for the activity. So. To summarize that bit, activity and experience can be a key to constructing categories, and that category members gain membership by virtue of activity and experiences. So I propose that we keep that in mind. What about those games then? Not yet. But we're getting closer. I'm just going to assume here without further argument that games are produced within what some call the cultural industries, described in some detail in this second edition of David Hesmondal's quite comprehensive and useful book. Uh, the cultural industries use genres and genre systems. They base their products on formulas, sequels, and what we usually call genres. And um, one of the primary uh, reasons for doing that is thought to be that they minimize risk. There are other reasons, of course. But I want to not focus on that. It just means that there's a business aspect of this as well. It's easier that way. It's also thought that the genre concept in cultural industries to span and connect 
production, product, and reception, in the sense that there is a tacit contract here between producers and consumers. The tacit contract is supposed to enable relationships where both sets of actors get what they want, money and gratifications, respectively. Just elaborating a little bit on how these genres and genre systems work, they can be more or less local to the different cultural industries. Here's some examples from the domain of popular music, where we have folk and reggae. Um, some genre systems and genres span different domains, domains in this case, uh, crime fiction, which means that novels, films, television, games can participate in that genre. And one might even say that genre uh, crime fiction is a small genre system in itself with uh, several sub-genres, some very well-defined ones in there as well. Here are some of the authors who've dealt in detail with genre within sort of film and television literature. It's uh, Rick Altman, Steve Neal, and John Frow. There are others, but I based most of my argument on this one, this selection. Uh, this is how Altman describes the aspects of Shar. Uh, I would argue that both Neal and Frau share this perspective, even if terminology and specifics differ a bit. Uh, as you see, genre has semantic, syntactic, and pragmatic components, which roughly translate to content, structure, and overall goals of communication. Of course, this semantic, syn syntactic, pragmatic approach, I think, can be traced to primarily, but of course, it's one among other sources, Carolyn Miller's seminal article from 1984, Genre as Social Action. The payload of that article was a more ethnographic and wide embracing approach to genre. Every typified communicative action is potentially a genre and part of a genre system, which means that love letters, sermons, ransom notes, recipes, etc., they're all typified communicative actions. Now, I've seen film scholars, which is my home domain, they make funny faces when you say something like this to them because they're kind of used to genres being something of a literary thing. So they don't like the idea that I say that recipes are a genre or ransom notes are a genre. But I don't know how you feel about that, but most people tend to accept the point about typified communicative actions. So they exist. And also that typified actions in general exist, and some of them are communicative, but, communicative, but let's just keep both in mind, that there are types of actions, types of activities. And I want to emphasize one point from Frau, which is a passage where he uses the words of Alfred Schutz to describe genre as a finite province of meaning. Frau described that's a genre. A genre is a finite province of meaning. And Frau describes these as representational. But he also states that Schutz originally referred to them as experiential. So I propose that we go for both, actually, but emphasize the experiential dimension that they're both representational and experiential. You see where this ties in with artifact and experience. Genres are finite provinces of embodied experience, so I managed to get embodiment in there as well. Here are some of the cognitive assumptions of such a position, that people expect genres to behave according to norms and conventions, which is another way of saying that they expect well-known experiences, in other words, generic experiences. Two more points before moving on. First, here are some Wittgensteinian points found in the work of Frau to some extent Altman, which I expect most modern genre, genre theorists would concur with, the kind of a reaction against monolithic ideas of genre. It's that any given work or utterance participates in many genres at once. Also that a work or utterance exhibits multiple traits of typicality also at once. And typicality can be identified on many levels, which means that genre works do not belong to one genre. And this is the second point, genre could be seen as generic resources for producers to engineer generic experiences, which means that genre repertoires allow players to experience genre works as generic. If they don't know what's going on, they won't get the experience that the designer shot for. Also, if they, don't, if they come to this as a new game, they're not going to be seeing it as generic, even if the game is. Now in all caps. Um, okay, let's try. So I'm going to be applying this uh, semantics, syntax, and temp... Uh, I don't like syntax, though, this semantic syntactic. It's something that they get from linguistics, and we, of course, have another domain here, which is visual, oral, haptic, all of these things. I'm just going to be using it still, because there's a point in saying that there are semantic units in games and that they're combined in, in interesting ways, both in temporal causal connections, but also in atemporal structuring. And then, of course, I'm going to get to the pragmatic interactive thing later. But just quick example here. This is Red Dead Redemption. You can see how 
It utilizes many of these semantic units that we know from Westerns. We have horses, six guns, lassos, people being lassoed, all of these things. So it's both semantic in terms of the units that are used here, but also some of the actions which tend to go into the syntax part. Here's another example. These are production stills. They're not, so these are also used to communicate what kind of experience are we shooting for. <laughs> in Red Dead Redemption. So you have the Winchester rifle, the gloves, the lasso, again, leather pouches, and there's a fair bit of dust there around the uh, uh, stagecoach as well. Of course, this implies also some syntactic patterns, if you want. We've got all the temporal causal patterns and atemporal logics of the Westerns in there as well. We've got robberies, chases, duels, sheriffs, Indians. And we've got the atemporal logics of wilderness versus civilization, The frontier that sort of separates the, well, all of these things on one side and one on the other. Uh, these things are not specific to video games, I know, but they're still highly relevant for an analysis of game experience because they're generic. People expect them to be there. Designers play on that. But control mechanics, of course, are specific to video games. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. First of all, there's a level of primitive actions, what I call P actions here and the way that the human body is coupled with the material interface. And that's actually highly generic. Interfaces come in these generic forms, which means that the way that the first person shooter, for instance, structures interaction could be said to be an interaction mode, which is kind of an action char of its own. So interfaces are generic and the interaction modes that games come with are generic. Um, the result of this coupling of player and interface and representation is that we get to perform micro actions in the world of the game, that we get to run, jump, duck, hit, aim, and shoot, and these are all generic as well. And they go with different genres in the sense that, uh, for instance, the platform genre has this jumping thing. Uh, as I've argued, that this could, the experience of that could be talked of as that the player experiences a body image in action, which lies somewhere between body schema and body image, because it's a body image that can't really be analyzed. It's something that you experience while you're acting. Um, that body image in action can also be generic and well known. We know how it feels to control Mario, how, know, know how it feels to control Marcus Phoenix across games and across game. So that can be a generic experience as well, to experience a generic body image in action. And there's also the integration of these smaller actions into large-scale projects of actions, as Schutz called them. The predominant design pattern is game, in games is to structure such larger-scale projects as quests. So Espen Horset, among others, has a neat taxonomy of quests, where quests are grouped in kinds. So we have generic projects of action there, generic quests. These can be analyzed in terms of diegetic goals as well as non-diegetic, but I won't go there. Um, even though it's an interesting discussion. Also, there should be something more on this slide, namely that this is where uh, semantics and syntax is tied to pragmatics in the sense that it's tied to the experience of actually interacting with the world of the Western. All of these things come together, that you are the person on the horse with the lasso and all these things, and you're enacting these atemporal structures, that you get to take part in the moral universe of the Western, the way that it, the game world is simulated as a natural and social structure in the case of Red Dead Redemption. Um, and this is to pick up on this uh, point with uh, Frau and Schutz and others, which means that the world of experience that you get with a game is not just the projected world, it's not just the game world, it's a world of embodied experience, that's the finite province of meaning and all gels together in that finite province of experienced intentional action. So the game world could be said to be the world of the game is play. That's the experiential domain. And many aspects of that experience will be generic, is my argument. And in the paper, I uh, also sort of wanted to talk a little bit about how this, or rather these two games, can be said to, to offer kind of similar experiences, kind of similar finite provinces of meaning. Well, the control mechanics are a little like, uh, are a little the same. John Marston feels a little like uh, Nico. Uh, some of the quests are like, just like Espen would have said. The moral structure is to some extent some of the same thing about being an outlaw, being an outsider to civilization. 
But it's also due to the fact that Rockstar uses the Rockstar Advanced Game Engine to produce both games. It's not just about authorship, there's also a technological component here in that I can't remember whether it's Euphoria or Endorphin that's used to refer to the runtime plugin of that thing, but anyway, the way that they model human physiognomy in that game is of course the same across these two games. Just like you can sort of identify, if you're really cool with that, identify similarities in games that use Havoc, for instance, that it's the same kind of physics simulation. In this case, it's the same kind of sort of uh, ragdoll, you could call it. Um, there are some similarities as well in the way that they use dialogue and expositional uh, cutscenes and dialogue during long transport scenes, the way that cover feels a little identical. Uh, there could have been other slides up here, for instance, there could have been three, Oblivion, Fallout 3, and Skyrim in the sense that people have been talking about how Fallout 3 felt a little like, you know, Oblivion with guns. And I have this distinct feeling playing Skyrim now that it's a little like Fallout 3 with swords. Um, which is, of course, because Bethesda uses a lot of their generic resources across games so that we get the thing that they invented more or less with the... Um, switch between first and third person slow motion that was uh, inherent in these death animations in Fallout 3, we get those uh, quite often in Skyrim and all of other things. So if I should summarize, and I think I'm gonna do that right now and leave some time for discussion, um, I think we're stuck with Wittgenstein's loose and fussy categories, uh, but on the other hand, it's quite possible to identify a large variety of generic resources that go into games to enable player experiences. And that game experience is potentially generic across a lot of identifiable levels, but I also want to emphasize the point, the caveat that I came up with in the beginning, that all of this, of course, depends upon the player biography, the genre repertoire of the player, and um, people that have already adopted this kind of approach, think of that as completely self-explanatory. But if you're only into categorizing artifacts, you would say that games can be generic, and then you would have to sort of take on board that the experience would be generic as well, but the point here is that the games are generic and the experiences are potentially generic, and they may become very generic once you play a lot of games. But there's also the point that they can be generic and very, very minute, sort of uh, that these game designers may play another game and say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna steal that reloading mechanic while running because I like how that feels. Also, I wanna try and connect this to some of what M Mia said about these players sort of looking elsewhere for the same set of gratifications. That can be said to be sort of genre repertoire in action, that they want the similar experience from some other product. And I think this is more or less taken for granted in the industry that players will behave like that, audiences behave like that. They seek out things that are, well, well known. Of course, they want a little bit of the new to it as well. But I think I'll actually stop there and you can just grill me on why this is so completely ridiculous. Okay, I want to thank Andreas for an extremely well-disciplined and well-timed uh, presentation, which is very nice for the person who's moderating. Now, time for a few questions. Okay, I think this lady at the back had her hand up first. Hi. Um, I, I, I enjoyed your talk, but I have a bit of a problem with the examples coming from the same developers. I mean, you talking about Bethesda and Rockstar and Skylink. Well, yeah, of course we're going to see the resemblance, but I was wondering how your theory could shed light, uh, for example, on the recent cases of um, uh, plagiarism uh, in games. You know, can we use you know, some of the elements that you've been describing you know, as to make an argument whether two games are similar to each other when they're by different developers and their accusation is like, you have ripped me off. Microphone. It's for the streaming. And for it's for the, the streaming. Board. Okay. Yes. To reiterate, can this uh, help explain plagiarism? I don't know. That's a discourse space that's probably a little bit more contested than this one. Uh, but I would say that, of course, if you can say that this uses, I mean, the same kind of character 
design, the same kind of character animations. It simply plagiarizes assets on the semantic level. It's the same kind of plot. It's the same kind of dialogue. It even sort of steals what we did first, the cover mechanic, in that way. Yeah. So, so it just seems what is interesting and provocative about what you're talking about is that there are different levels of resemblance. You know, like you've you've gone through like yeah. the different theories of genre, and it's kind of like, like if we were going to apply this, you know, like from philosophy to you know law, like what are the levels, you know, and what are the levels that we care about when it comes from to to plagiarizing? Well, like is it the semantic level? Is it the you know the mechanical level? Is it the cover? Well, that's an interesting question, of course, because I think that, that this needs to be, you know, <laughs> applied in different situations, basically, that this guy stole my plot or this person stole my character design. That, and, and there is this, well, I think, kind of tacit contract between producers that everybody works within these things. They have a lot of middleware tools, and I think I could have had a Penny Arcade cartoon in here. <laughs> where he's sort of making fun of these completely ridiculously generic character designs that he sort of criticizes and makes a mock-up of. But I think there's also been this, uh, 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 what's Jerry Holkins, Mike Krahulik, the guy that draws. Mike got into a kind of argument on Kotaku because he was defending a game, I think, Dark something, <laughs> with uh, character designs with, with a comic uh, artist that he liked, and everybody thought that those were completely generic in the sense that this is uninteresting. So that there's a seek into cliche as well here, I think, but it, I think this can be more or less applied to sort of saying that the first person shooter shares some things but doesn't, and it also, it's also compatible with this whole science fiction, fantasy, whatever, but I mean, it's all in there. You can also throw classification schemes in there if you want to. I think my, my primary point here is that we don't need the word genre to d identify um, sort of instances that will go together and d deliver the same kind of experience, basically. It doesn't have to be called a genre for it to do that. Anybody on that? Any other questions? Okay. Okay. I'm getting nervous now. <laughs> I just had uh, two little comments uh, uh -huh. uh, about the, your use of uh, semantic, syntactic, and uh, pragmatic. Uh, you said that you didn't want to use it because it came from the linguistic. I don't like syntax. That's my syntax. only problem. Okay, yeah. because uh, the, 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 those categories were uh, introduced by Morris, and he is a philosopher, so you can feel really good to use it because it's a, a kind of category oh. <laughs> used in philosophy. So, too, so, in the sense that linguists, no, they're not, but if it's a philosopher thing, no, uh, the problem that I have with uh, using syntax is that it's derived from an idea that we have identifiable morphemes that can be combined in only a very strict yeah. way. And uh, coming from a field that sort of is interested in visuality, I think that it's very, very difficult to actually say that there is a language-like combination. Also, there, there are no sort of, well, there are no morphemes, but I think that there are semantic units, though. That I, I'm okay with that, but that's probably because I like cognitive semantics. Yeah, in, in um, visual uh, uh, semiotics, they use the, those words, they use the tanks, syntaxic to express how the elements are construct and how uh, like a grammar, it, it's the, the same. Uh, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, Maurice mm -hmm. worked a lot with uh, Peirce, uh, Charles Sander Peirce. Yeah. And uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if you work with Peirce, but maybe you can find some, uh, some tips to uh, not use the jar, but more the type and how the type are constructed. And maybe it's a, a way to understand the, the typification without yeah. the jar, the really, uh, uh, really strict uh, combination of... Uh, Construction of categories. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, just just a brief comment on that. I, that, that that's helpful. I, I like purse. Uh, it's so sûr that I have a bit of a problem okay. with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so semiotics. That's fine. I yeah. think what 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 is essential to understand is that semantic is a level of, of units, and that there is this other level where what you need is the relationship between yeah. those those units, and and in in linguistics that's called syntax and grammar. Mm -hmm. But, but you can, of course, have all kinds of discussions within semantics that there's some you know, underlying role semantic, whatever. What is interesting here, I think, or necessary for me to get across is that it's, it's a level that can't be identified on the other levels, or that it instantiates it. 
but it has to do with the relationship between units. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's also interesting relationships between all of them. What does it mean when control fails, for instance? Thank you. Uh, I really liked I really liked the trust of uh, of the paper, and I think it's uh, really spot on. Uh, the, the only thing I would I would say is that, um, uh, but but it's positive. Like if oh. you want to to go further, I would suggest looking into Thomas Roberts. He wrote a book called uh, An Aesthetics of Junk Fiction, in which he says, yeah, well, there is genre literature, but. Uh, the people that are going to read that are fans of a certain literary genre are not only looking for repetition, but they're looking for variation. Yes. So uh, basically the conventions are the melody and we listen to it like the, to jazz musicians. What we really are looking for are the variations. And he goes through science fiction literature and shows how the convention of a body shield has emerged through progressive, um, uh, uh, we might say iterations through multiple authors. Yeah. And, and that's really cool because it ties into something else, another author author from literary, uh, with, who is Alastair Fowler. He wrote uh, Kinds of Literature in 1982, and he says, he goes back to Wittgenstein, so basically that sentence. And like Marilyn Ryan, he says that uh, basically the uh, family resemblances owe more, in, in the case of artistic objects, they owe more to uh, tradition and um, kinship. And that's particularly appropriate when you look at games using similar engines because there is a depth that is clearly identifiable and it mm -hmm. can be said to be part of this tradition because there are other works that have come before it. Yeah. So, and basically Roberts does exactly that practically with science fiction literature and uh, you, you also have that author uh, as well, Alastair Fowler. So, uh, mm -hmm. well, that go sounds there. interesting. I think, I think when going from those authors, authors that I mentioned is, is that I, uh, recently been working with this that what isn't there is a better idea of what the pragmatic means in terms of video games, what, what interactivity is, but also there's no mention of technology. They're not really interested in large books or small books or whatever. And in our case, I think it's the algorithmic underlying layer that's interesting. Of course, we don't, I mean, we're not able to do what Nick Monfort does with sort of pulling apart an Atari cartridge anymore. So we'll have to look at a slightly higher level of abstraction if we want to identify technology. So it's really a kind of middleware approach that I'm, I'm urging here. But it's just that I think it's possible to synthesize across all of these, as you do also, Tommy. So, <laughs> so yeah, I'll read your paper. I promise you that. <laughs> but uh, I, think, I think also this, uh, this thing about it's, it's, it's generally acknowledged in, in the rest of the sort of uh, leisure studies and all of these, the cultural industry studies, that all of it is really very conventional. But there is development going on all of the time that there's a very processual sort of activity-centered approach to this, that everybody's looking at what, uh, what they're doing and they're stealing like, wow, I like that close-up. So that genre evolves constantly. And of course, it also sometimes uh, evolves because players do interesting things. I didn't get into that at all, but this connects a lot of what we've been talking about, sort of that there are certain issues where genre developments are really due to key contributions from, from players we realized that this would be a good thing. That's why they play test things, I guess. I think maybe, maybe, but first I have to check something because uh, the next person uh, who is supposed to speak is Caroline Jong. Ah, you're there, good, <laughs> I'm glad, I was just wondering. <laughs> so I think we can give Andreas a, a, a nice applause now because... Uh, <laughs> yeah.